Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony, and welcome to lesson number 17 of our series on purpose. We're finding out that, first of all, God had a purpose, a plan, a calling for each and every one of us in his master plan that he designed before the foundation of the world. And through this series, I believe we're also discovering what that specific plan is for our life. You know, there's a general plan we've been talking about that relates to uh, a shared calling, a shared purpose and plan that God has for all of us in Christ. But within that, we also have a specific calling, purpose and plan for our life individually. And God knows how to get that across to you, but God not only gives you the plan, the purpose, the calling, he also gives us everything we're going to need to fulfill that calling and run our race and finish that race with joy. Now, the last couple of lessons we've been over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want to go back over there again today and just kind of, uh, kind of hook up from there and move forward in the next couple of lessons. And I believe these are going to be really good for you as you uh, embark on finding out, running, and fulfilling the race that God has called you to do. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, now again, this is talking about Paul is relating the thorn in the flesh he had. And I've already made some comments about that. And if you're just now joining us, you'll have to go back and hear some of that because I don't have time to go back into that again. That's not really... Uh, what we're really focused on right here. We want to get to the bottom line. What is Paul trying to get across to us? Many times we get caught up in speculation and, you know, reasonings and, and trying to figure things out. You know, what is that thorn in the flesh and exactly and, you know, where to come from and all that. Well, you know, we can get just caught up in those things to the point that we really miss the bottom line. And, you know, so we just need to cut to the chase and find out. In verse number nine, he actually explains this. This is what he's trying to get to. He said, and, and Jesus said to him, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now notice, first of all, Jesus said, it's my, my grace. It's, it's, it's the kind of grace that Jesus is full of, you know. John chapter 1 said that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And he's saying right here, my grace is sufficient for you. And again, the Greek uh, wording on that or translation should read, and a lot of translations do read it this way, my grace is more than enough for you. You know, that word sufficient, sometimes we, we kind of get the idea, you know, sufficiency could just be just enough and no more, not, not a drop more. But actually, he's trying to relay right here that his grace is more than enough. This is not a negative no answer to Paul in, in what he had prayed to Jesus. This is actually a revelation to Paul of how to overcome. See, the grace of God in our life coming from Jesus is not a put up with grace. It's not just a foot rug grace where we're just putting up with the enemy and he's just, you know, the and Jesus is just telling us put up with whatever he's doing, just kind of be a foot rug for now. When you get in the sweet by and by, everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything's going to be great. No, the grace of God and the revelation of grace actually is an overcoming thing, not, not a put up with thing. <laughs> and he actually goes on to read here. He said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So notice he equates his grace with his strength. Now notice he says, my strength, my grace, my strength, more than enough, is made perfect in weakness. In other words, it perfects our imperfections. It perfects and takes up the slack and makes up the difference for our own personal weaknesses. Now our weaknesses are our limitations. We have natural limitations. You know, in our flesh, in our natural life, in our natural mind, we have a lot of uh, uh, limitations in that natural realm. We have a lot of inadequacies, insufficiencies. You know, we have needs and we can't meet all the needs and the demands of life. And so Jesus is telling him right here, my grace is more than enough. In other words, when we reach the end of our rope, his grace makes up the difference. 
when we are just swallowed up in our weaknesses, we're just you know overcome and just drowning in our own inadequacies and insufficiencies. He said, my strength perfects you. It becomes your sufficiency. It becomes your adequacy. Uh, it becomes the the supply to every need and the need and the and the solution to every problem that we have. See, it's all found in His grace, which is in Him. That's what He's. This is the whole revelation right here. And I tell you, you're going to need that revelation if you're going to run His race and finish it with joy, because the, God's calling and purpose for our life, individually or generally in Christ is going to require this grace in our life, us receiving grace. Now again, everything that God makes available through grace, we have to receive and access through our faith. Faith is the receiver to what God, grace is giving. And again, grace is something unmerited, nothing, nothing that you earn or deserve or perform for. That's not what grace is. It is unmerited favor. If we have to earn or deserve it through our own methods and means, and our own uh, merits, then it's not really grace. It's not really unmerited favor. It's actually a reward or a paycheck. And we're not dealing with paychecks. Here. We're dealing with grace, something that God did for us that we could not do for ourselves. God's supplying something to us free of charge that we could never earn in a zillion lifetimes, so to speak. So notice he goes on to say, he said, uh, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities, infirmities means weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So notice synonymous terms. Jesus' grace equals his strength. His strength also is equaling the power of Christ. Now, what is the power of Christ? It's the power that God released in Jesus when he raised him from the dead. Now, we're, really, we were the target for that. God had to work through Christ in order to get it to us. See, Jesus already had all that. He didn't need, need all that himself. He came down, there, came down here and became what we were so that we could become what he is. He absorbed those weaknesses so that we could be, and we have, we have access to that supernatural strength and power that's coming from him. And again, it's all through grace. So when we, you know, when we've expended and exhausted all of our resources and everything that we could do, and we're just getting, we're just drowning in our own weaknesses, inabilities, inadequacies, and insufficiencies, that's not the end of the game, because then we receive His grace, His strength, and again, strength can be in any area in any of your life, any arena of your life, spirit, soul. Uh, body, your soul it means your mind, will, and emotions. That needs to be strengthened. Your physical body, that would that needs to be strengthened. You know, many times the Bible refers to uh, sicknesses, diseases, those kind of things as infirmities. Though that is weaknesses here. That's a lacking of strength. But what do we do when we're lacking in strength in our physical body? Well, we can receive His supernatural strength and power into our life to make up the difference and supply the need. We can be weak in financial provision. And in fact, if you're gonna fulfill God's calling in your life, it's gonna to have to go beyond your provision. We've been talking about that in the last few lessons now, that there is supernatural provision that God has already provided for every single one of us, not only just for our own individual needs, but for you to fulfill your divine purpose and calling. And you know, every time that God gives us a personal divine purpose and calling, generally and specifically, it doesn't just include our needs, it includes somebody else's needs. So the supply is gonna be not just for us, but an overflow to help somebody else. God wants to make you a distribution center. That is all part of our general calling, I can tell you. So notice right here, again, that Jesus' strength equals his, or his grace equals his strength. In other words, his sufficiency and our insufficiency and in the power of Christ resting upon him. So this is the revelation that Paul got that he needed in order to fulfill God's divine purpose and calling in his life, because it was way over his head, as well as all of our purpose and calling, it's way over our head. Now again, we're not just talking about fivefold ministry here. I'm not trying to call everybody to the fivefold ministry, 
But all of us have a ministry of some type, whether you may not be a uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, one of those fivefold ministry gifts, but you still have a ministry. In other words, you have something that God's put in you, a calling on your life, a gifting in you that God wants to bring out that's going to bless somebody else. Ministry is nothing more than an administration or a distribution, a, dispens a, a dispensing of what God has put on the inside of us by grace to somebody else. Now, we looked at this one also, but I'm going to go back over there again. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 4 reads this way. And I'm going to go to the uh, Passion Translation on this, verse number 4. And it reads this way. He said, for although he was crucified as a weakling. He's talking about Jesus. Now, why was Jesus crucified as a weakling? Because he became what we were. When he was on the cross, we're getting a picture of us. A picture of man in sin and, and in the fall. So when he was crucified, although he was crucified as a weakling, now, see now is present tense, present tense reality. Now he lives robed with God's power. Well, see, that's also a picture of us right here in grace. That see, he, he uh, was crucified in weakness to do away with it, insufficiency, and reconnect us. See, we were disconnected separated and disconnected from the supply of heaven. But what Jesus did in his finished work and provides for us by grace reconnects us and restores the supply line between heaven and earth again, between God and us. So he's now robed with God's power as you are. See, we live on this side of the resurrection. We don't live on the other side as believers. Now, if you're an unbeliever, you need to get born again. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead after becoming sin for us and confess him as Lord of your life, you will be saved or born again. You will experience that new birth. It's instantaneous. And God puts everything that he wanted, uh, everything necessary uh, in our life. He puts that, deposits that on the inside of us in our spirit. It says, for we are, we also are weak ones in our co-crucifixion with him, but now we live in God's triumphant power together with him, which is demonstrated on your behalf. See, this is a revelation of Paul. You know, I got to thinking and praying about this the other day when I was getting ready to minister this to the to Church 316 here in Athens, Georgia. And in fact, you can get online and see the live service on the YouTube channel, the Church 316 channel. Uh, but anyway, I, I got he began the Holy Spirit began to show me that throughout Second Corinthians, that that whole uh, tapestry of God's sufficiency by grace is woven throughout this entire this entire book, and I never really noticed that before. You know, we're kind of reading toward the end of this of this book here, but that's not when he actually got the revelation. He had the revelation, and then he wrote Second Corinthians. He wrote to the Corinthian church. And so we see that revelation just intertwined and interwoven, integrated throughout the whole writings of 2 Corinthians. Just uh, as an example real quick, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, toward the very beginning here, and we could go through the book and show you this, but I want you to just point some highlights out. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 reads in the New King James, Verse 4 says, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. See, our trust in God is through Christ, through his finished work, what God provided in Christ. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. See, that's the problem. See, that's where we get discouraged. That's where we get, we want to throw in the towel and quit because we're, we're trying to find sufficiency in and of self. And you're never going to find it there. You, you're going to reach a real short ceiling and a, a real small boundary of what you can do. And it's not going to be enough to fulfill what God has called us to do. So he said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That's why our trust is towards God in Christ. Because notice our sufficiency, our sufficiency is of God. See, in and of ourselves, we have needs. We can't meet the demands of life or 
ministry or our, our daily living or fulfilling God's purpose in our life in and of ourselves. So we have to look beyond ourselves. We have to trust beyond ourselves and trust in God through, through Jesus and his finished work, what he provided. And so our sufficiency is from God. When you find yourself being insufficient, then you're going to find a grace to make you sufficient in life. And then verse 6 says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Notice, he made us as sufficient, uh, sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit, but uh, uh, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I want you to see there, he has made us sufficient. In other words, he has put everything that we'll ever need at our disposal through grace to be received by faith. Everything, it'll, it'll swallow up your insufficiencies, your inadequacies, your needs, your demands, not just personally, but whatever your calling leads you to do. That sufficiency is already there. That's what we've been pointing out. God has already foreseen the needs that we were going to have in life and in our ministry, whatever that is, whatever our calling is specifically. And he's already made that provision. He's already provided for that. It's there in the storehouses of heaven. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 8, and it reads, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all-sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now again, I like the... Uh, the uh, amplified version of that particular verse so i'm just going to read it out of the amplified verse verse 8 there and it says that god is able god is able to make all grace see there's a grace to to meet any need in our life it says god is able to make all grace every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance see there's that all sufficient more than enough grace he's talking about there He's, he's able to make all of his grace come to us in abundance. That means more than enough. David got a, uh, a revelation of that. He said, my cup runs over. Yeah, God knows how much it would take to fill that cup to the brim and no more. But he, he overflows it because he wants you to know his nature, his character, his ability. And he wants you to trust in that, not in your inability. So he says, come to you in abundance so that you may always, always, and under all circumstances. In other words, there's not going to be a circumstance in life where God's grace is going to fail us, where his sufficiency and provision, whatever that might be, is going to run out. He says, and all, under all circumstances, and whatever the need be, uh, whatever the need, be self-sufficient. Now, self-sufficiency comes from his sufficiency through grace through Christ Jesus. He says, whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support. That would be from the outside, from the world system, from some man-made thing. God wants us to go to him and his kingdom. He said, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Now, you know, we, I'm just going to quote this really quick, but over in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16, it reads this way. It said, let us come boldly. Boldly means confidently. Let us come boldly, confidently to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. See, when you fit that in with everything else we're putting in there right now, we're seeing that at any point of time, your time of need, in other words, where you don't have a supply, you in, uh, in and of yourself that are insufficient, inadequate, you don't have enough supply to meet the demand, you are weak in and of yourself, you're in the negative column, then you can go to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in that time of need. More than enough abundant grace that God's abounding toward us in Christ so that we, we're not going to be in need anymore. Our need is going to be swallowed up by his supply. The demands of life will be met according to his sufficiency in grace. And coming boldly and confidently means that we know that God's going to provide that. 
He's not going to turn us away and say, no, you're going to have to wait, not this time. No, the, the very fact that God sent Jesus down here means that he was willing to open up the windows or the floodgates of heaven once again and to pour out his sufficiency, his strength, his power, his supply to meet our needs in whatever time of need that we find ourselves in. Now see, when we have that kind of confidence, we see that that's available already, already made available through grace. And see, every everything that I'm going to face, every obstacle, every challenge, any attack of the enemy, the adversary against me, against what I'm going to do to try to throw a roadblock in it, when I know that I already have sufficient strength, power, resources, abilities to overcome that and to, and to get victory in that situation. You know, the Bible says that he always, always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. In other words, the grace, strength, and power is available to overcome and be triumphant in any situation. If I know that I already have that before I go in it, that's going to provide me a great peace during that situation. Even though I may find myself in insurmountable odds, things that are coming against me in the natural, I don't see any way out of, any way to meet the needs, any way to the meet those demands. It looks like maybe in the natural, the enemy had maybe, maybe have the upper hand here. Then I know that there's sufficient grace available for me to put me over in that situation. And see, again, that gives me great peace. And that's what we're talking about today and probably the next lesson. We're really talking about the, the peace. But we ha in order to have peace, you have to know there's sufficient grace, strength, ability, resources available for you to put you over in any and every circumstance and situation that you might find yourself in on this side. Now, with that in mind, let's go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, because in talking about peace, God wants us to walk in peace, but this peace is not like what, what the world's idea of peace is. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. It's, it's God's brand of peace. It's based on something else beyond just natural circumstances and external things. Notice what Jesus said here in John chapter 16 and verse 33, and I'm just going to go into the amplified version of this one because it really brings out some things in here that I really, really like from the Greek. It says in verse 33, Jesus is talking. This is right before he went to the cross. He's preparing his disciples, preparing us as well for life. And he says this, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. See, again, grace and peace go together. How many times in the Word of God does he begin a, an epistle or end it or both with the words somewhat like grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus? See, grace and peace go together. In fact, our peace is grace dependent. So he said, I've told you these things that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence in the world. See, in the world, you're going to face things in this world, in this natural realm that we're talking about in running your race. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. And, you know, if we didn't know there was a grace, didn't know there was a grace supply available to put us over in any of these situations, now I tell you, we could just throw in the towel and quit and just say, well, we can't do it. But see, he's telling us something different right here. He's wanting us to have perfect peace and confidence. He said, in the world, you're going to have challenges, tribulations, trials. Yes, we are going to face things in life. We have an enemy, an adversary down here. We have people that side in with him and yield to him that are going to try to throw a roadblock in the plans of God for you. But that's not the end of it. He said, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. said, take courage. Be confident, certain, undaunted. Love that. He said, for I have overcome the world. See, all those tribulations, trials, distresses, frustrations that we experience in the world, Jesus said, I've already overcome those. In other words, he didn't overcome it for himself. He overcame it for us. He got victory for us. He fought our battles for us on our, in our place, in our stead, and then handed us the victory on the other end. He said, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it 
of its power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Now, yeah, you're still going to have to face those challenges, but your, your fight is not a natural fight. Your fight is a fight of faith that see through faith I'm accessing, receiving what Jesus has already done and provided in his finished work by grace, and then I'm beginning to walk that out and see the manifestation of it. So right in the middle of bad circumstances, I can begin to cheer up, take courage. I begin to rejoice, knowing that there's more than enough grace to put me over in any and every situation of life. And on the end of it, the test is gonna turn out to be a testimony. Yeah, you're going to face these things in running your race, but know that you have sufficient grace from God available for you to put you over. All right, now, with that in mind, go to John 14. We're there in the Gospel of John. It's going to go back a couple of chapters here to John chapter 14. And notice the verse 27, New King James here. It says, Peace I leave with you. Now, Jesus again is talking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you. So notice he's making a distinction between his brand of peace and the peace that the world offers, which is a pseudo peace, is temporary, fleeting, you know, is, is based on externals, the absence of problems, the absence of trials, the absence of war, the absence of conflict. But see, Jesus said, you know, you're going to have those things. And my peace is going to put you over because my peace is connected to the grace supply. And it's going to be more than enough to put you over in any situation. So as the world says, all right, as long as the external is going good, I can have peace. But I tell you what, that can only last a few moments most of the time. you know. And I can tell you the peace of God that passes all understanding is going to, is going to keep you, guard you protect your heart during those times when it looks like everything's falling apart. He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, that peace that comes from Jesus, he left us by inheritance. It, notice right there, it guards our hearts and minds that we don't have to be troubled in heart. Yes, we'd be facing troubles on the outside, but we don't have to be troubled in heart and we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to allow fear just to paralyze us and grip us on the inside and keep us from moving forward because we have the same peace that Jesus walked and lived in, and he left us his brand of peace. Well, that's all the time I've got for this lesson. We're going to pick up right here uh, in, in the next lesson, talking about this supernatural peace that we have available that we can walk in from Jesus. And until then, if you'd like additional materials and resources, you can always check us out on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we will see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.